I just want everybody to know how grateful I am to be here. Uh, I, I'm very ex- thank you, Steve, for the reminder. Uh, very excited uh, about what God has placed in my heart to share this morning, and it's all about Him. Amen. It's not anything to do with me. Uh, I don't profess to be anybody that's, that's great. It's Christ living in me. It's not me myself. I'm just thankful for the calling that God has placed in my life. Um, and, and if you don't know me, I know we have some visitors here this morning. And, and if you've never met me, my name's Gary. Bill Snow is our pastor. He's not here this morning. He's actually going over uh, to Georgia to, to be in a special service of, of his, his older pastor that he used to attend the church of. So I'm going to be filling in this morning. And, and if, you haven't, if you haven't ever been here when I'm preaching... Uh, I, I flow a little bit differently than Bill, and, and that's good, amen? I, I think it's good that you have different people in the body of Christ. Uh, in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, it said, if the whole body were an eye, then where would be the hearing, amen? That's why I was thanking God a while ago when I came in the church, and it was about 80 degrees in here, that I'm not one of those suit preachers, you know? I don't have to have on a suit to feel comfortable when I'm preaching, uh, I'm thankful that, that God has blessed me. I get asked a lot, and Stephen, Stephen and I were joking around about this a while ago, but I get asked a lot, you know, why don't you wear a tie? The next person that asked me that, I, I think I'm going to just say, well, why do you want me to decorate what God has commanded me to crucify? Because that's my flesh. And I'm not here to crucify, or I'm not here to, to, to uh, decorate anything. I just believe in sharing the Word of God, and I'm grateful for the Word of God. I think it is life-changing. I think it is powerful. And this morning, I want to just start off in the book of Genesis. Uh, I, and I've tried. I really have. I've tried to be like other pastors. There's people that motivate me. And, and uh, you know, as a young guy, I, I listen to other people and, of course, listen to Bill, love Bill, think. God for Bill Snow Church because he's such a wonderful man of God that has impacted my life. I've never ever, and many of you could, could say this, I have never ever met another man like Bill Snow in my life. You know, yeah, give him a hand. There's, there's tons of people where you could, you could compare preachers and you could compare pastors and, and pastors like to compare pastors and churches and things like that. But when you really think about it, I don't know of anybody that I could compare to Brother Bill. He's just a special, special gifted person. And I'm so grateful. But I've learned that I can never preach like Bill preaches. I can't. I like to be able to do it. I like to come in here and I like to know exactly what I'm going to say, but I don't. I'd like to know exactly what scripture we're going to go to this morning. I really would, but I don't. I'd like to have bullet points and outlines and pictures. I'd like to be able to give my sermons to Miss Donna three days ahead of time and have it prepared for me as an outline. I would like to be, and I've tried those things, and every time I tried them, they went over like a pregnant pole vaulter. All right? <laughs> it just don't work for me. It doesn't work for me. It's not me. It's not who I am. So if you're visiting, just know I flow a little bit different, but we're going to have a good time in the Word of God this morning. Turn with me to the book of Genesis, chapter 22. Genesis chapter 22. That's where we're going to start off at this morning. Now this, this is a very familiar scripture for a lot of people because a lot of people have heard this story, but I want to forewarn you. This morning, I want to forewarn you of one thing. You cannot shut me off as soon as you realize this is a familiar story this morning. Okay? Because we tend to do that. We come into churches and we come into services, and if you're like me, I, I was brought up in church, been in church for a, a long time now, several, several years. My parents always had me in church, and I've heard just about every Bible story you can imagine. And I have to always guard myself and, and always put myself in a place where I say, Garen, don't shut this off just because you've heard it before. Just because you've heard it before. Because the Bible says that faith comes by hearing. Amen. Notice that it doesn't say faith comes by what you've heard. Ever thought about that? How many of you in here could say that you have heard something that you no longer believe? You heard something at one point in time that you no longer believe. Well, the Bible doesn't say that faith comes by what you heard. It says faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. So faith, if you want it to grow, if you want to be able to apply it in your life, if you want your faith to be exercised and to stretch and you want to be able to actually use your faith and have it as a tool in your arsenal, if you want faith to grow, then you have to be hearing constantly. It's not just about what you've heard. It's about 
what you're hearing right now. Now, let's take it a step further, because in the book of James, he says this in chapter 1. Be ye doers of the word, and not what? Hearers only. If you're a hearer only, he says this. Hearers only actually deceiving yourselves. See, I've come to find out that a lot of people in church justify their relationship with Christ by what they have heard. When all along our relationship with Christ should be justified to ourselves and to the world that we live in, not by what we've heard, but by what we are doing. Not even by what we've done, but what we're doing. See, faith is a very progressive thing. And and when I preach this morning, I, I want it to be progressive for all of us. I want us to understand and know that this is something that has to be continuous in our lives. It has to be growing. It has to be stretching. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23, it says, Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible seed. Being born again. The word born, if you were to look it up by definition, means to be brought forth. The word again, if you were to look it up by definition, one of the words that it says is to continue something. So what it's talking about is that we are constantly being brought forth again and again and again and again. Until Christ takes us where we need to be in him. The the Christian lifestyle, the way we live, it's a perpetual thing. It's about progress. It's about moving forward. It's about knowing more. We can't just be hearers only. We have to be doers as well. Because it's not about what we've heard. And it's not about what we've done. It's about what we're hearing. And it's about what we're doing. Can somebody just give me an amen on that? Thank you, church. Stand with me for the reading of God's holy word. Remember, don't shut me off this morning when you say I've heard this story before. Faith comes by hearing. And I don't think any of us this morning want to cheat our faith out of any growth. Genesis chapter 22, starting with verse 1, it says this. And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham. And he said, Behold, here I am. And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. And Abraham rose up early in the morning, and he saddled his ass. I said it. I'm going to say it again here in a little bit. And he took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son and clave the wood for the burnt offering and rose up and went into the place of which God had told him. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the ass and I and the lad will go yonder and worship. And I will come again to you. I have never, ever preached out of this scripture. I have referenced it several times. But this is a scripture, honestly, for me to you. I'm sharing this with you. I'm being transparent with you this morning. This is a scripture that I think about every single Sunday. Every single Sunday. You know why I think about it? Because this is the first time that your Bible mentions the word worship. And look what the situation is. Look at what is about to happen. Look at what Abraham is about to do in this particular situation. And think about what he calls it. He calls it worship. We come into church every Sunday and we say we're about to Worship. But worship, according to this, is about giving what you love. In fact, it's about giving what is most valuable to you. It's about giving your best. But how many times do we really do that? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you so much for your word. It's so powerful. And God, this particular scripture... It's more than a two-edged sword for me. God, this is something that is 
daily, daily reminded me of how I should live for you. God, this particular passage shows me so many things. It's overwhelming. I don't even know how to talk about it this morning, but you want me to say something, so I'm going to. Father, I just pray, Lord, that as we dwell on this thought this morning, as we think about this circumstance, this situation, what's actually taking place and what Abraham chooses to say, he calls it worship. Lord, this is so powerful. This is life-changing, God. And Lord, I just pray, Father, that you would help us, God, to to come into a clear, better perspective, better understanding of what worship is and should be to us. Father, as your word goes forth today, I know it's not going to return void because it never does. That's a promise. So God, I just ask this morning, Lord, that we learn how to worship. You told, you told Jesus, you told the woman at the well that the hour is coming and now is when the real worshipers will not worship here nor there, but will worship in spirit and in truth. God, I pray this morning that you would open our eyes up to the Spirit and that the truth would be revealed in us. I ask these things in your holy and precious name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. I am just beside myself excited about this word this morning. This is so rich. This is so good. Even from the start, it starts off in in verse 1. It says this, and it came to pass. I could preach right there. I could preach for probably the rest of my time right there. And and I've got a a family reunion that I'm going to this afternoon. So you can imagine how badly I want this to be over so I can go, right? I'm excited about it. (laughs) Yeah, I was being sarcastic. All right. It starts off by saying this, and it came to pass. That one's going to get me in trouble with my mama as soon as I walk out of here. And it came to pass. I, I want to tell you that in life, most things come to pass. There's some things that are everlasting that we'll be able to experience. There's relationships with people that we'll be able to experience that they last. They last a lifetime. But most things that happen to us in life, they come to pass. And what happens is they come into our lives in different scenarios and different situations and different problems. They come into our lives and and they come as a temporary thing. But we're so captivated and we're so caught up in this thing, this situation that has come into our life. And we allow it at times to totally consume us. When people who are on the outside of your problem can look at it and say, clearly, that's come to pass, you feel so derogative about it. You feel so negative about the situation. Why? Because you're the one that is caught up in it. I would imagine that Abraham on this day could have said, Lord, why in the world would you ask me to do this? Why not somebody else? Why does it have to be me, God? Why am I the one that has been chosen to carry this out? You know, if you could look a couple of chapters before this, you would see that before Abraham became this great man of faith right here, he actually had some pretty rough issues. We are talking about the same man that told his wife, when we go into Egypt, I want you to lie. He said, baby, you a good looking woman. When we get into Egypt, there's big guys down there. And they're going to want you. So what I want you to do, this is Abraham. I guarantee, Gary's not making this up. This is in the word of God. Abraham says, so look, honey, when we get there, just lie and tell them you're my sister. Because if they find out that you're my wife, they'll kill me to get to you. So just lie. Just tell them that you're my sister. What a rotten thing to do. He's a scoundrel. 
Right there. Just lie. We're talking about Abraham, father of faith, father of the nations, this man that did all these great things, but yet he still was a person. He still made mistakes. He did these things. Abraham, when this part of his life comes, when God test Abraham and, and ask him to do this, Abraham could have said, why, why in the world do you want me to do this? This is absurd, Lord. This makes no sense. This is crazy. You, God, you're the one that promised me. You're the one that promised me this child. And now you want me to take this promise that you gave me and you want me to put it on the altar and offer it up as a burnt offering? You want me to do, you want that to be your sacrifice? You promised me this, God, and now you're about to take it away from me. He could have had that mentality, but he never did. Because Abraham understood one thing that most church people really don't get. When God speaks, reason is never required. It's never required. See, we want to we try to get people to agree with us before we go out and do what God's called us to do. We want to get that, that backbone. We want to get that support. So when God tells us to do something, most people in the church, they start campaigning about it, right? We're going to start our campaign. We're going to go out. We're going to get as many people as we can to agree with me. And, and we're going to try to find these folks that want to do this alongside with me. We're going to pick people and we're going to pull them in. Let me tell you something. When God tells you to do something, reason is not required. So don't try to get other people to agree with you. You're not going to go and get a bank to fully agree with something that God has called you to do. You can't get the world to jump on board with God's plan. Why? Because they don't know it. It's been kept as a mystery to them. Your word says that the mysteries of God have been revealed to us. Don't expect the world to operate out of our own Christian principles because it's not going to happen. They don't know. Can I tell you a secret? They don't know what you know. They don't know what you know. They don't understand what you understand. That's why when a, a homosexual does something on TV, they get a support group for it. Because they don't know what you know. They don't understand what you understand. That's why when terrible things happen with different people that are in the world today, people just, they clap their hands or, or, or they say, oh, it'll be okay, it was just a mistake, they'll just move on. They don't know what you know, they don't understand what you understand. Or they don't know maybe what you should know. Or maybe they don't know what you should understand. Don't expect the world to get on board with you. I always like to use this illustration. Everybody, I reference this so many times because God just continues to show me different things about this. But everybody's heard the story of Jesus walking on the water and Peter being there, right? Raise your hand if you've heard that story. All right, don't cut me off. If you've heard it, don't cut me off, all right? Because you will cheat your faith if you cut me off right now. I'm just saying. It comes by hearing, not what you've heard. Peter and the disciples are in the boat. And the Bible teaches us that the wind is boisterous and there's a storm coming. And, and these men of God, these men of God, who walked where he walked, who slept where he slept, who stood beside him, who listened to every word that he said, these men of God, right there all alone with the great Messiah, they get scared of a storm. They're in fear. Jesus has been teaching them this whole time that they have dominion and power and authority over this situation, but nevertheless, they still live and they still act in fear. Let me just interject something very quickly into this. I want you to know that in the book of Genesis, when God gave, if you want to study this, you can. But when God gave mankind dominion, he actually said over all the things that move, can I just tell you this morning that you have authority over everything that moves? I'm not talking about physical authority. All right, so don't be trying to beat folks down and, you know, take them hostage and all that. I just want you to know that spiritually, you have authority over everything that moves. I, I'll never forget going through a low place in my life, even in ministry. I was on my way to work one morning. I was praying. I said, Lord, I just pray 
God, please give me authority over this situation in my life. I'm tired of dealing with it. I want it to be done. I want it to be fixed. I want it to be repaired. Please, God, give me authority over this. And God spoke to me, which he does every once in a while. He spoke to me and he said, Garen, stop begging. Okay, Lord. He said, stop begging for something that I've already given you. He said, first of all, people only beg for something when they're uncertain of whether or not they're going to get it. Second of all, you're asking me for something that I've already given you. You just need to act in it. You need to take ownership of it. You need to live in it. Christ has given us authority over this earth, over these situations. So here we have these men of God. Back to the story. Men of God in the boat. Storms, wind, boisterous, waves, tall, high, boat rocking, all that good stuff. And they're in fear. And then all of a sudden, they see an image walking towards them across the water. Right? And, and, and many of them thought that it was a ghost. They said, look, there's a ghost. And Peter looked out and he said, I think that's Jesus. He said, Jesus, is that you? He said, if it is you, bid me to come. And Jesus said this back to Peter. One word, what was it? Say it again. One more time. Come. That's all he said. He didn't give him seven points to walking on water. He didn't read him a beautiful poem about walking on water. He just said, come. Do it. Step forward. Walk. Come. That's all he said. And so you know what happens. Peter steps out. As he steps out, he's walking on water. He's doing what Christ is doing. Let me tell you this. It's a good thing that nobody else in the boat stepped out because Jesus wasn't talking to them. He was talking to Peter. Here's what we got to learn how to do in church. And this ties in directly to Abraham's situation. Stop trying to make somebody else's word your word. God may not have called you to do that. He may have been talking specifically to somebody else. If God gives you a word, you know who that word is for? It's for you. It's for you. You are the harvester of the seed of God. See, you think the harvest comes from God's hand, but it don't. It comes from yours. God gives you the seed. You sow it and reap. That's your responsibility. Abraham could have said, Lord, why in the world do you want me to do this? But he didn't. You know what the Bible says Abraham did? He didn't say a word. It's my favorite part of the story. The Bible says that immediately the next morning, Abraham awoke and he saddled the ass, the donkey. He just started getting it ready. He just started preparing. God told me to do it. Bless God, I'm going to go out and I'm going to do it. He didn't try to get consolation from anybody. He didn't try to talk to people about it. God, can you imagine what people would have told him if he tried to share this with others? See, that's why God, there's people in the church that God has told them to do something. They share it with somebody else and people are like, man, that's crazy. Don't do that. You'll fall. Abraham doesn't tell a soul. The next morning, he immediately gets up and he starts getting ready. He just starts getting ready. You want me to tell you what I found out? And this applies in ministry, but it also, reply, uh, it also applies in, in the world that we live in, in your everyday life. The people that are successful in this world are the people that get up and get stuff done. The people that are successful in this world are the people that get up early in the morning and get stuff done done. It's the people that wake up out of bed and say, Lord, today I'm going to fulfill your plan. 
It's the people that say, Lord, today I'm going to bless you. I'm going to honor you with how I live my life. Lord, today I'm not going to talk about getting stuff accomplished. I'm going to get something accomplished. Lord, today is your day, Father. I'm going to magnify your life with how I live. I'm going to be a mouthpiece for you. I'm going to speak what you would have me to speak. I'm going to walk as you would have me to walk. I'm going to live as you would have me to live. I'm here. I'm awake. I'm ready. What's on the agenda for today, God? Abraham just wakes up and he starts doing what God told him to do. I wonder, when will some of us wake up and start doing what God has asked us to do? When will that unction finally enter into you? Where you'll say, you know what, if God told me to do it, bless God, I'm going to go and do it. Not find out why he told you to do it. Not look for excuses or explanations on why you don't want to do it. If he tells you to do it, just do it. That's all you got to do. Abraham wakes up. And the Bible says that he starts to prepare the donkey. This is this. Oh, this is so vital. This is preparation. This is where so many people fall short. He starts preparing the donkey. He starts getting ready for the journey that he's about to go on. Preparation is always key. I'm going to use a, a Nick Saban quote right here. I hope that doesn't offend anybody. But uh, I just had <laughs> getting the fist look from people in the church. I don't want to offend anybody, but I, I want to use a Nick Saban quote. This is what I heard him say in an interview. And I, to everybody else, it's probably like, that's stupid. You know, that don't make any sense. But I heard him say it, and it stuck with me, you know, in, in my spirit. Because, I mean, Nick Saban's a spiritual role model. Anyway, they said, Nick, this was, actually, this was uh, the year that they played uh, LSU for the national championship. And they were going to New Orleans, I believe it was, which was close, you know, close for the LSU boys and, and, a, and a pretty good drive. And, you know, basically, it was like they were going to play a home game in, in, at LSU. They said, Nick, what is your plan for preparation? And how do you intend to keep your players focused on what they have to do? He said this. This was genius. It blew my mind. He said, well, the most important thing is we have to play the game before we even get there. I said, what? I wanted to just say amen, you know. That's powerful, man. He said, we have to play the game before we even get there. I said, man, talk about preparation. <laughs> we got to play the game before we even get there. In other words, we got to already take the steps and we have to prepare ahead before it even happens. You say, Garen, what does that mean to me? Let me tell you what it means to you. It means get yourself ready because God's about to do something great in your life. It means get your steps in order. It means get your life in order. Get your finances in order. Get things prepared. Get things fixed. Get things ready because God is about to do something great in your life. He has a bigger plan than what you're walking in right now and he wants you to be ready. He wants you to be prepared. He wants you to be willing to do it. But you have to take the necessary steps to get there. It's amazing. It's amazing. I remember, I don't know, I guess it was about six years ago when, when, when Brooke and I, five or six years ago, Brooke and I were getting ready to get married, and it was in the summer where we had that terrible drought. Does everybody remember that summer? I mean, it rained zero, no, no rain, no rain the whole summer. And I kept hearing people, you know, they were having prayer meetings in the state of Georgia because lakes were going dry and all these devastating things were happening, and people were actually having joint prayer meetings about rain. They, they wanted it to rain. And then... I remember a bad storm front coming in. Everybody's like, man, I sure hope it don't storm. <laughs> Are you kidding me? If you want the rain, you got to take the storm with it. Stop asking for the rain if you're not willing to go through the storm. People in the church, they want to plan big. They want to talk big. They want to do big, but they don't prepare big. Abraham got up, started getting his donkey ready for the journey that was ahead of him. Peter, 
In Acts chapter 12, Peter, are y'all having fun? I'm having a good time. Peter in Acts chapter 12 was in prison. He was sitting, Corey, check this out, man. He was sitting between two guards, all right? So you imagine like you and a guy as big as you over here. Peter is sitting right here in between two guards in the prison. And the angel of the Lord appears to him. And the angel of the Lord walks into the prison. Nobody knows it's there. And the angel actually says, it smote Peter on his side. Woke him up. He said, Peter, get up. Peter got up, looked at the angel. And the angel said this, Peter, gird yourself. Get your shoes on. Put your clothes on. We're getting out of here. And Peter thought he was in a vision, so he starts doing everything. He's putting his shoes on. He's getting his clothes on. He's getting ready to move outside of the jail. He's excited about it. And that's what I feel like God wants to say to the church. Wake up. Get your shoes on. Put your clothes on. Get your armor on. We're about to go do something great. Get ready because we're moving. Get ready because something awesome is about to happen. Ah, but we're just sitting here. We're just caught up in our own little prison, in our own little cell. Boundaries built by ourselves, holding us back from our real potential that God has in store for us. I, I want to tell you, I don't know what your plans are for your life. Hopefully you'll just be like me and say, whatever God wants, you know, because I, I really am. That's me, whatever God wants. But whatever your personal plans are in life, God's are bigger. They just are. They're just bigger. And his plan right now, it may not even make sense to you, but I want you to understand that it's bigger. I'll never forget being in, in Euport, Mississippi. You remember this, Matt? We were in Euport, Mississippi, and uh, we were leading worship in a church. And this has happened to me twice, and I, I could elaborate on both times, but I won't. But we were, we were in a camp meeting down in Newport, Mississippi. There was a guy preaching. I don't even remember his name now. I think Matt does. But uh, we, we were in there, and uh, I'll never forget. It was the summer after I graduated high school. And uh, I had already tried out, and I had made this band that I was going to go play in in Atlanta. And the band was actually up on their feet, and they were doing great things. And I used to play drums and all that good stuff. And, man, I was just a young guy, you know, on fire, excited about going to play the drums. Because drummers, yeah, you get the chicks, you know. They get all the girls. And when you're 18 years old, that's all you care about, really. So at 18 years old, I'm all excited about what God has in store for me and what his plan is and all these different things. And, and this guy's up there preaching, and he just stops out of nowhere, just out of nowhere. And he says, Gary, I know you think, I know you think that you're supposed to be over there playing with that band. He did, in front of everybody in the church. He said, but God daydreams about what you actually could be doing. Wow. God daydreams about what I could do for him. What an awesome story. What an awesome example I could be setting for others. So I begin to understand, you know what, God's plans, they really are a whole lot bigger than mine. Let's see, I, I, I'm already a good bit past what I expected for myself in all areas of my life. And it's not because of my plan. It's because of God's plan. So you've got to prepare for the plan that God has. This, this was not Abraham's plan. What God commanded him to do was not his plan. God says, Abraham, I want you to take your son. I know I promised him to you. I know you love him more than anything in this world. But I want you to take him. I want you to go on a journey. And when you go on this journey, I'm going to show you a mountain that I want you to go to. And when you get there, I want you to take your son. I want you to place him on an altar and I want you to offer him up as a burnt offering to me. Could you just 
Could you just make that, for those of you like me in here that have kids, could you just make that a personal scenario, just mentally speaking, for just a minute? It would be like God saying, Garen, I want you to take Malachi, and I want you to give him to me. You're not going to have him anymore. I want you to give him to me. Garen, I want you to take Marley. Just put your own kid's name in this story. And think about whether or not you could go through with this. For most of us, it's, it's an immediate answer. Lord, I can't. But Abraham never said, I can't. He just did it. He never said anything at all. He just did it. And the Bible refers to this as worship. Something so powerful, something so moving, a sacrifice so great, a sacrifice so beautiful, but yet so dreadful. And they label it with the word worship. Matt, Matt wrote a song called This Is What Worship Is To Me. Uh, really good song, really powerful. And when I heard the words of it, I started thinking, well, what is worship to me? Because I've heard people say over and over again, you know, that worship is a lifestyle. I was like, ah, I don't know about that. If worship is a lifestyle, then why don't we have worship services? You know, well, what is worship? I started studying it. And I found out this reference for it in Genesis 22. And I said, God, I don't know if that's what worship is to me, but that's what I need to make it. I need to make my worship to God always be about taking what's most valuable to me and exchanging it for what God has in store. God, this is yours. I'm giving it to you. It could mean the world to me. But if it means that much to you, God, it's all yours. Have you ever thought about this this way? That God did not ask Abraham to do something that he didn't do himself. That gives me chills. Because that is the mentality of a real father. That's a real daddy. That could say, I'm asking you, son, to do something that seems so dreadful to you. But understand, I'm not asking you to do something that I wouldn't do myself. Because this, though it seems dreadful right now, this is going to lead into something beautiful. This is going to lead into something that's going to exceed all expectations. Abraham just takes his hands off and says, Lord, it's yours. Lord, I give it to you. It's all about you. I think for most of us in the church, we come into worship services. We take that time every morning, and for a lot of people, it's, I hate to say this, but for some people, maybe it's going through the motions. But I can say just from experience on filling in with with the band on Sunday morning that it's not going through the motion for them. In fact, it's work. It's always work for me when... When I have to say, Brooke, you know, I need you to get both the kids ready this morning. I'll try to help you, but I got to leave early because I got to go help lead worship. It's work, it's effort, it's practicing, it's doing something that takes time out of your life. Yet, so many times people come into a worship service and we just sort of go through the motions. And I guess my question is this. 
how could you be so insensitive to the Spirit of God? Sensitivity to the Spirit is imperative for a Christian. It's critical that we at all times are sensitive to the Spirit. We can't become numb to it. There's some people that have said no to the Spirit so many times that they don't even hear the Spirit speak anymore. They've just become numb. No conviction. No motivation. Glazed over eyes. A tired, weary, beat down look about them. Because their sensitivity to the Spirit has been lost. Let me tell you a quick story about me having an opportunity to be sensitive to the Spirit. Last year, I had an awesome opportunity uh, to go and be the evangelist at, at Alabama camp. And uh, I had about 120 young people there. And, uh, just really awesome to, to preach, you know, to preach 10 times in five days uh, for me was, was very tiresome, but yet at the same time, it was so fulfilling because when you figure out what God has called you to do and you start doing it, you can't get enough of it. You can't get enough of it. And um, I, was, I was in the middle of a, a message that I was preaching that night. And uh, I was talking about I was talking about Mark chapter 5, where it speaks about the man who was possessed with legion, the, the demon of legion. And uh, the Bible describes this man as being a man who was an outcast. He was put out on a hill. He was away from the city. And there's a part in there where it talks about day and night, this man. i got to be careful that I don't start preaching that story. But it's a day and night. This man was crying out, and he was cutting himself with stones. Now, I got to that part of the scripture, and I had not intended on saying this at all. But I was in the message. I mean, we were right in the middle of church, you know, just like this right here. There was no altar call. There was no music going on. It was just me preaching. And I said this. You know, in this generation, a lot of you here, you may not know this, but in, in this generation of young people that's coming up now, they have these people that call them cutters, cut themselves. And for, for us as adults, we're like, well, that's stupid. It is stupid. It really is. But for young people, there's a lot of kids now that actually battle this. And you're like, well, that doesn't make any sense. Well, a lot of things that the devil does that make any sense. But that doesn't mean that it won't have an impact. An impact. And so <laughs> I get to this part of the scripture and I said, you know, I know that in this generation, there's a lot of kids that cut themselves. And I said, the Bible doesn't really give us any kind of, you know, any kind of knowledge about that situation. It doesn't really talk about that. But in this particular case, it does directly link that to demon possession. Because here we have a man who's possessed with demons, and the Bible says that he's crying out day and night and cutting himself with stones, trying to relieve the pain that's on the inside of him with crucifying his flesh on the outside. We may not cut ourselves, but we do the same thing. I said that, and when I said that, this young man stood up, and I thought he was going to knock every pew in front of him down to get to the altar. He came running to the altar. He got down there, and I just kept preaching. He got down there, and a couple of kids got around him, and they started praying for him, and it was really an awesome, awesome time. I never, ever have experienced that. As a minister, I've never been just up talking to somebody, boom, the Holy Spirit directly, you know, speak to their heart about something I'm saying, and boom, they, they come flying down to the altar. But see, that's what being sensitive to the Spirit of God does for you. Sometimes God asks you to do something that doesn't make any sense, but you got to do it. You can't just not do it. You've got to do it. He's asking you for a reason. You don't know what the reason is, but you got to do it. Service was over, and that young man came to me. He said, man... I felt like you were reading my book. Or you were reading my book. I said, no, I wasn't reading your book. I've just been reading his book. I don't know anything about your life. I didn't know the kid. Never met the kid before that week, ever. I said, I don't know anything about your life. I just know about his life. 
It's being sensitive to the Spirit that allows us to move. It allows us to, to, to do things that are beyond our expectations. God asked Abraham to do this, and Abraham immediately becomes sensitive to the will of God. He says, Lord, I'll do it. Whatever you want me to do, I'll do it. And the Bible calls that worship. This morning, we're going to do things a little bit different. Uh, there's a young lady here that wants to anoint a prayer cloth for her dad. I don't, if y'all want to come on up, you can. There's a couple other people that I've talked to this morning that want to be anointed as well. Uh, if you want to be anointed for somebody that's sick in your family, for somebody about to have a surgery, come on up. Hey, Brian. We're going to take time this morning just to pray, of course, about these situations. And we're going to be sensitive to the, uh, to the Spirit this morning. We're going, to, we're, going to, we're going to ask God to meet the needs that are, are before Him. But at the same time, I want us to truly worship this morning. In spirit and in truth. So many times when we're in worship services, the song ends... we sit with a whole lot of worship left inside. Don't let that be the case. Worship Him like He deserves to be worshipped. Worship freely this morning. Take the most valuable thing in your life, whatever it is, you think about it right now. For Abraham, it was the promise of God. It was Isaac. It was his son that he loved more than anything in this world. God asked for it. He said, I want to know that I'm more important to you than that. I guarantee you God is pointing into somebody's life in this house this morning. And he's saying to you, I want to know. I want you to show me that I am more important to you than that. That thing that you're so fixated on. That thing that you love so much. That thing that you desire so much. Show me. If you were to look up the word worship, by the definition, it is a feeling that is expressed of adoration. It's showing what's on the inside of you. That's what worship is. Showing what is on the inside. It's a feeling that becomes expressed. It should be overflowing. It's not something that we contain. It's something that we do. It's something that we act out. It's something that we express. So this morning, we have an opportunity to express it. The band's going to sing a song, but I'm going to ask family and friends to come up of these that have come down this morning. We're going to anoint a prayer cloth this morning. Brother Steve Ramey, many people know that he had a heart attack. And we're going to just pray for the healing hand of God to come and bless and move. We also have Charity here this morning, who has a young relative, five months old, going through a major operation, major surgery here in just a few days. We want to pray over that situation as well. Church, if you would, stand to your feet. As we pray this morning down here, and as you guys have this opportunity of worship, I, I want to just ask you to let the freedom of God reign in this house. Worship Him with your whole heart. If you need to get down on your knees before Him, if you need to get on your face before Him, however you need to express what you feel inside, that's what worship is. It's an action. It's something that you must do. So I pray that you do it this morning. Is there anybody else that would like to come and have a word of prayer with these young girls this morning? Any more friends or family that want to join us? You're welcome to. At this time, I'll let the band play. We'll have a time of prayer and worship. And I cannot hear you. I hold on to what is true, though I can't see. If the storms of life they come and the 
road ahead gets deep, I will lift these hands in faith. I will Staying desperate. Staying desperate for you, God. Staying humble at your feet. I will lift these hands and praise. I will believe. And just tell him I'll remind myself. And I remind myself of all that you've done and the life I because of your son, love came down and rescued me. Love came down and set me free. I am yours. I'm forever yours. Mountain high. This mountain high, valley low. I sing out, remind my soul. I am yours. I'm yours. I remind myself. I remind myself of all that you've done and the life I have. God, because of your sin. See it again. Say, I remind myself. I remind myself of all that you've done and the life I have. And the life I have. God, because of Love came down. Love came down and rescued me. Love came down and set me free. I am yours. I'm forever yours. Say mountain high. This mountain high is valley low. I seek out and remind my soul. I am yours. I'm one more time, love came down. I came down and rescued me. down and rescued me. Love came down and set me free. I am yours. I am forever yours. It's mountain high, valley low. I see out my soul. I am yours, I am forever yours, 
Let's have a word of prayer right quick. Dear Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for your word. God, for every illustration that you give us of how we should live. Father, I'm just grateful, Lord, for the story of Abraham and what he did. God, I'm thankful, Lord, that his faith rose above the circumstance. That his faith rose above the test. God, I pray that our faith, God, would rise above the test. Would rise above and go beyond the test of time, God. Lord, though things may come, though storms may come against us in life, God, though we'll go through trials and we'll go through temptations and we'll battle the flesh and we'll battle weaknesses and we'll battle desires, Father, I pray, Lord, God, that our faith would stand firm in you, that we would know, Father, that you're not a God who fails, but you're a God that prevails. God, I just pray, Lord, that you would totally consume us with your plan for our life. God, that we may not be so caught up in our plan, but that your plan would be made known to us. And Father, just as Abraham did, Lord, we would take ownership over the situation. We would take ownership over the calling. And Lord, help us to always remember, God, in the book of Ephesians, you said that we need to walk worthy of our callings. God, help us to walk worthy of the callings that you've placed in our life. Because God, when it comes down to it, we just want to make you happy. When it comes down to it, Father, we just want to please you. And how can we do that without our faith? Move in a mighty way, God. Have your way. Have your will in our life. In your holy name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen.